Watching the world burn, watching the world burn, August 21st, 2024, just a brief video for you. I uh, put up a huge video yesterday, totally wiped me out. I think I slept till about 2 in the afternoon, because <laughs> I was up all night working on that video. You know, when you watch a lot of these guys like the Economic Ninja or whatever, and they just go live and they make a brief 20-minute uh, video, no, they don't put all the content in that I do. I'm just saying, you know. All right, so we'll just get into a couple little things here. Fachi is one of the most evil people in world history. He belongs in, his, in prison. Cat turd. <laughs> Why isn't that guy in prison? I mean, we get back to Stalin. You know, kill one person, go to jail. Kill 10 million, and it's just a statistic. That's what, uh, that's what Fauci is. Breaking newly released documents reveal that the Biden administration knew Fauci lied to cover up dog torture experiments, according to the White House, the White Coat Waste Project. Okay, so yeah, there we go. Uh, Alex Jones, uh, and we did this uh, on my previous video. Uh, so I'm just going to like conclude right there. So this whole video is about Mr. Bean and what's taking place in Great Britain right now. Uh, Great Britain has fallen to the globalist. No doubt about it. Uh, I, I, I hope when you watch this, it disturbs you uh, greatly. It does disturb me. I always looked at the uh, people of Great Britain as, as uh, you know, fellow uh, Americans in a certain kind of way, just like, well, we used to look at the Canadians, but I mean, Canada's gone full communist. <laughs> you know, Mexico has gone uh, uh, to the cartels. I mean, it just seems like the whole world is just disintegrating around us. And of course, the United States, uh, I'm, I'm watching Redacted uh, today and 100,000 children have gone missing. And of course, Trump said that most of them are dead. Uh, and the Democrats are all for this. They're all for human trafficking. They're all for uh, uh, child slavery. They are all for uh, 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 open borders. Uh, you know, uh, they're all for the drug cartels poisoning uh, hundreds of thousands of Americans. I mean, do you see what the deterioration of our, our nation is, 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 is happening? But anyway, I, I just want you to watch this video about Mr. Bean. Uh, and, and, you know, the thing is... I, I don't want any money ever for this video because this is his video, uh, obviously. Um, and you can watch it on YouTube, but it's still there for now until they censor it. And uh, anyway, August 21st, 2024, peace out. Stay free. Consideration of any issue relating to free speech is my passionate belief that the second most precious thing in life is the right to express yourself. Riot police clashed with In this speech, Rowan Atkinson, known for his character Mr. Bean, expresses his strong belief in the importance of free speech. He considers it the second most precious thing in life, just after the basic need for food and shelter. And fully expects to continue to do so. Personally, I suspect highly unlikely to be arrested for whatever laws exist to contain free expression because of the undoubtedly privileged position that is afforded to those of a high public profile. Police said that they'd made over 60 arrests and expected that figure to rise as they tried to break up the demonstrations. Officers said that the arrests had been made for different offences. Atkinson explains that he has enjoyed the freedom of expression throughout his professional career and he expects to continue to do so partly due to his high public profile. So my concerns are less for myself and more for those more vulnerable because of their lower profile. Like the man arrested in Oxford for calling a police horse gay. However, he is more concerned about the vulnerabilities of those with a lower public profile who have faced arrests and charges for expressing their views, such as calling a police force gay or the Church of Scientology a cult. To illustrate his point, Atkinson references a sketch he did in the past on the show Not the Nine O'Clock News where a racist police officer, Constable Savage, arrests a man on a series of ridiculous and trumped-up charges. 
Like walking on the cracks in the pavement and walking in a loud shirt in a built-up area, during the hours of darkness this sketch is used to highlight the absurdity and potential abuse of laws that restrict free expression. Atkinson's speech emphasizes his unwavering belief in the fundamental right of free speech and his concern for the protection of this right, especially for those who may be more vulnerable to its infringement. When I heard of some of these more ludicrous offences and charges, I remembered that I had been here before in a fictional context. I once did a show called Not the Nine O'Clock News some years ago, and we did a sketch where Griff Reese Jones played Constable Savage, a manifestly racist police officer <laughs> to whom I, as his station commander, is giving a dressing down for arresting a black man on a whole string of ridiculous trumped up and ludicrous In this part of the speech, Atkinson addresses the argument made by some defenders of the status quo that the fact that certain cases, like the gay horse case and the Scientology case, were dropped is proof that the law is working well. Atkinson argues against this, explaining that the only reason these cases were dropped was because they had attracted significant public attention and publicity, which led the police to withdraw their actions, fearing the ridicule that was about to come their way. However, Atkinson points out that there are thousands of other cases that did not receive such attention and were not ludicrous enough to attract media attention. Even in the cases that were withdrawn, Atkinson argues that the mere fact that people were arrested, questioned and taken to court only to be released later is not a sign of the law working properly. Instead, he sees it as a form of censoriousness that has a chilling effect on free expression and protest. Atkinson then cites a summary from the UK Parliament's Joint Committee on Human Rights, which states that while arresting someone for threatening or abusive speech may be proportionate in some circumstances, language or behaviour that is merely insulting should never be criminalised. The core of Atkinson's argument is that the problem with outlawing insult is that too many things can be interpreted as such, and this leaves the door open for abuse, as the examples he provided earlier have shown. That was a police van burnt out. Up on the street that way, there's another police van on fire. And then down that way, I can... Although the law under discussion has been on the statute book for over 25 years, it is indicative of a culture that has taken hold of the programmes of successive governments that with the reasonable and well-intentioned ambition to contain obnoxious elements in society has created a society of an extraordinarily authoritarian and controlling nature. It is what you might call the new intolerance, a new but intense desire to gag uncomfortable voices of dissent. In this part of the speech, Atkinson argues that the law under discussion, which has been in place for over 25 years, is indicative of a broader cultural shift towards an extraordinarily authoritarian and controlling nature. He describes this as the new intolerance, a desire to gag uncomfortable voices of dissent. Atkinson criticises the common argument that one should only be intolerant of intolerance, pointing out that this simply replaces one form of intolerance with another, which is not true progress. He argues that arresting people does not address the underlying prejudices, injustices or resentments in society. Instead, these issues should be aired and dealt with, preferably outside the legal process. Atkinson believes that the best way to increase society's resistance to insulting or offensive speech is to allow more of it, so that people can build an immunity to taking offence and deal with the issues raised by legitimate criticism. Atkinson cites President Obama's statement that efforts to restrict speech can become a tool to silence critics or oppress minorities, and argues that the strongest weapon against hateful speech is not repression, it is more speech. He believes that for a robust society, we need more robust dialogue which must include the right to insult or offend, as even the freedom to be inoffensive is no freedom at all. Someone who we think a national treasure, what are you going to do about it? <laughs> And the police panic and they scramble around and then grasp the most inappropriate lifeline of all, Section 5 of the Public Order Act, that thing where you can arrest anybody for saying anything that might be construed by anyone else as insane. In this part of the speech, Atkinson discusses the repeal of a certain word from a clause, which he sees as a small but critical step in a longer-term project to address the creeping culture of censoriousness in society. 
He views this as a small skirmish in the battle to deal with what Sir Salman Rushdie refers to as the outrage industry self-appointed arbiters of the public good who encourage media-driven outrage, to which the police feel compelled to react. Atkinson criticizes the way the police can react to a newspaper report about someone saying something slightly insulting on Twitter by grasping onto Section 5 of the Public Order Act, which allows them to arrest anyone for saying anything that might be construed by anyone else as insulting. He finds this degree of latitude to be the most ludicrous and argues that the law does not need a real victim, only the judgment that someone could have been offended. Atkinson acknowledges that the debates around free speech on platforms like Twitter and Facebook have raised some important issues, such as the need for people to take responsibility for what they say. However, he argues that the law should not be aiding and abetting this new intolerance as free speech can only suffer if the law prevents us from dealing with its consequences. Atkinson expresses his wholehearted support for the Reform Section 5 campaign, which he sees as a necessary step in addressing the broader issue of the creeping culture of censoriousness in society. Colonel, my dear friend, welcome back uh, to the show. Thank you uh, for your patience during our time uh, in the penalty box. Colonel, what is the current status of the incursion by Ukrainian uh, troops and others into the Kursk, I think I'm saying that the way Ray McGovern wants me to say it, region of Russia. Uh, we have we have too many languages to master to do our jobs properly, don't we? Right. Uh, I, I think uh, we can say with uh, complete confidence that sadly, I, I guess if you're Ukrainian, uh, all of the heavy weapon systems, uh, Patriot missiles, uh, radars, uh, tanks, artillery, uh, EW, all of that, all of the equipment that has requires people to crew it has all been destroyed. Mm. They've used a number of Iskander missiles, a missile that has a range out to about 310 miles, to about, normally between 250 and 310, carrying a, a warhead that can be 1,000, 1,100, 1,200, 1,300 pounds, different kinds. I know they've used some fuel air explosive as well as high explosive, and it's just devastated them. They also have on either side of their, uh, their flanks right now uh, very tough fighters, Chechens, Wagner, and also some uh, soldiers from the Russian Volunteer Corps. And they are cut off from retreating back into Ukraine. I don't think very many of these people will survive. How many are Americans and Brits? Because as you rightly point out, I, I think we can call this tragically a NATO invasion, even though they may well not be in a Ukrainian or maybe in Ukrainian uniform as opposed to their own. And you also have Polish soldiers and officers. So this conglomerate has really, really gotten into trouble. They're, they're not going to make it. 